All right, so let's talk about kind of these long-term cumulative doses and, and what yeah. they may do. So if you go to Mars and back, that's a three-year return yep. trip that's minimum, right. as we've seen, and you're talking about a total dose of a half to one sievert. So a single dose of that would make you sick. You wouldn't feel great. And well, the question problems. is whether if you spread that dose that's over right. three years, it's different. Now, according to the linear no threshold model we've just talked about, it would still give you a few percent chance of dying. But some people think that's actually not the case if you spread out the radiation dose. Okay. The basic idea is that the radiation is breaking your DNA. Yep. But your DNA is breaking all the time, mostly from free radicals, oxygen radicals. Mm -hmm. um, and so the body has repair mechanisms. Okay. The body can repair broken DNA and does. There are millions of cells in your body right now where broken DNA is being repaired. Yep. So this idea would say that maybe as long as the dose rate is quite low, your body can fix it. Okay. It only doesn't fix it if it's damaged, and then before it's repaired, another bit of damage yes, comes in. That's right. And so it blows the DNA apart in two locations. Yeah. Even double faults can be repaired. But if you've got three or four faults, the body, nah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So maybe if there's a low dose spread over a long time, even though it adds up to a huge dose... The consequences may not be as bad. Yes. So the rates are not too bad. Deep space, it's about one millisievert per day. That's still a lot more than on Earth. On Earth, the typical background radiation is two millisieverts per year. Okay. Um, low Earth orbit's about half a millisievert per day. And we know the body has repair mechanisms. So the rates are low, spread over a long distance, and we do know the human body can and does solve the damage. And there are some interesting cases of people who've been exposed to incredible amounts of radiation, okay. but because it was spread out so much, they've actually survived. The most famous case is Albert Stevens. Yeah, I've never heard of them, and I'm quite curious about this. Yes, yeah, so this guy, um, <laughs> back in the 1940s doing the Manhattan Project, a lot of people working on it were getting accidentally exposed to plutonium. Yeah, yeah okay, fair enough. And the government was worried, they didn't know how it was going to affect them. And so they decided to do a very ethically dubious experiment that I hope would not be allowed today, but this was under military secrecy in the 1940s. Yeah. They took a bunch of people yep. who were terminally ill okay. and injected them with large doses of plutonium. They thought these people were going to die anyway, yep. so we can inject them with plutonium and then see how much plutonium is flushed out of the body, uh, how much, how radioactive they become, where in the body it settles down, these sort of things. Mm. And Albert Stevens was one of these people. They thought he had incurable stomach cancer. Yep. It turned out he didn't have incurable stomach cancer. He actually had a gastric ulcer. <laughs> Very different. <laughs> Which was cured. That was the same. <laughs> but by that point, he'd been injected with large amounts of plutonium. <laughs> The total dose he got over the rest of his life is about 60 sieverts. So that's... 10 times the lethal dose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ten t but in fact, he had showed no symptoms, lived to the age of 79 and died of heart failure. <laughs> that, uh, look, wrong that the experiment happened. It's amazing that he lived. You know, it's interesting when you talk about the ethical dubiousness because people quote this with going to Mars, right? That maybe some people who are terminally ill can be the first people to go to Mars because the cancer rates are higher, but... Again, as we're seeing, not necessarily the case. That's right. So this is a problem. Um, there's actually a whole club of people, um, some of whom are still alive, who were ex accidentally exposed yes. to levels of rate plutonium. And in fact, the cancer rates amongst these people has been lower than that of the general population. Interesting. Maybe plutonium makes you safe. <laughs> there are actually some people who think that radioactive hot springs in Germany are now being toting the health benefits. Oh, and some people think low levels of radiation could actually be good for you, not bad for you. Um, Another example is a bunch of apartments in Taipei in Taiwan yep. uh, were accidentally constructed using radioactive rebar. Okay, how it's accidentally constructed that way, I don't know, but okay. Yeah, but some uh, uranium isotopes presumably made their way into the rebar. Yep. And it turns out that they were getting a dose of about 8 millisieverts per year for 18 years. And there was 1,100 residents who were exposed to this. Okay, so that's a large number. That's more than the people who've been in the space. Yes, I mean, it's 80 millisieverts per, per year, not per day, but yep. uh, it's still a lot of, adds up to a lot of radiation. That's right. And in fact, people found the cancer rates amongst these people was lower than the average for people who lived in similar apartments in Taipei. Okay. Um, there's background radiation. I mean, right now, sitting here, we're probably being exposed to about uh, two millisieverts a year. But if you live in the most radioactive place on Earth, which is Kerala, India, then you're getting about 0.1 millisievert per day background okay. radiation. Okay. And in fact, the... Uh, it depends what house you're in. Some houses yes. get more radiation than others yep. and so on. But basically, the people who live in the more radioactive houses live longer than those who live in the less radioactive ones. It's not statistically significant, so it's probably yeah. just a fluke. Yeah. But there's certainly no sign 
that the radioactivity at these low levels is killing people. And, and this also goes back to the point that you're making earlier. It's all about probabilities, right? And it's all about rate. So it doesn't necessarily guarantee that it's going to be lethal to you. Yep. Now we know at higher yes. doses, yeah. it's bad for you. For example, there were people who used to paint yes. radium yes. onto the dials of watches yep. and they would lick the, uh, the, uh, the brushes to make them pointed. That's right. And they, people of those who got doses of 35 to 80 millisieverts per day, yeah. and a lot of them got bone cancer and died. Yeah. Children near Chernobyl were exposed for about over two or three weeks to between 30 and 2,000 millisieverts per day. Yep. This is basically mostly that the uh, uh, radioactive iodine uh, was incorporated into the grass, the cows yeah. ate the grass, it expressed into the milk because iodine is chemically similar to calcium, and then drank the milk and got it from that. Mm. This could have been blocked if they'd had iodine pills, because yes. that fills up their uh, thyroid, but they didn't. Um, and we know that about 100 of them were killed by thyroid cancers. That's sort of a large rate because there were 20,000 who were exposed, so 100 over 20,000 is a very small percentage. But still definitely a number. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot depends on that how the radioactivity spreads. In both these cases, it was actually inside the body. Yeah. Um, here it was radium, and the radium um, is similar to calcium, and so it got incorporated into the bones. Yes. Whereas here it was iodine, that was, um, well, it's um, cesium, which was similar to iodine. Yes. And so it was getting incorporated into the thyroid. Yes. So it depends on that, whereas the radiation in space is just coming from the outside. It's not going to zoom in in your thyroid or your bones. So it may be safer than this, if anything. But we know that at these levels, 35, 80, 2000, it's definitely bad. But as in the previous slides, these are levels, 8 millisieverts per day, yeah, 8 millisieverts yeah. per year. It seems the body can repair from it, or at least if there is a risk, it's such a small risk you can't see it. You can't measure it, that's right. Um, what does this mean for space? Well, yeah. It's actually very unclear. Yeah. I mean, we're really, because of the chance of dying from this is so low, we don't know. Maybe we just have to send some astronauts up there and see if they die. People have looked at roughly 300 astronauts who spent a lot of time in low Earth orbit, and as far as we can tell, their, their cancer rates are lower than the general population. You know, but it, but so that, it's this, only 300. Yeah, it's only 300, and also these 300 are very different from the average 300 as well, right? You know, th th their fitness and all sorts of things. And the particular worry is these high yes. galactic cosmic rays, because they penetrate deeper, yeah. and that's like the uh, bazooka shell rather than the pin. Um, they could knock out, they could do several points of damage to DNA all in one hit, possibly. Mm. Uh, we've never really had any populations yeah. of animals or people exposed to us. Maybe we just need to send lots of dogs to Mars and back, but it's going to be very hard to keep a dog alive and fed and That's right. on a robot mission to Mars without people there to look after them. Yeah. So, um, and of course, solar storms are very dangerous, we've already talked about those. So, the short of it is, we hear a lot about radiation when it comes to human space flight. But it's not immediately clear how we're... Yes, it is a problem. We know that. But there are solutions to these problems, and maybe the long-term consequences aren't as well-defined. It could it well be not a problem at all. It could be that the damage is coming in slowly enough that you can repair it. You have to take shelter when there's a solar yes, storm. Yes, exactly. But the general background level, particularly these unshieldable galactic cosmic rays, yeah. maybe it's okay. Yeah. But maybe it isn't, and I'm not sure there's any way to know. But most likely we're talking about a, a few percent chance of dying. That's right. And then there's the ethical question, are we justified in sending astronauts out if there's going to have a few percent chance of dying? Would you go if you had a few percent chance of dying? Well, and this is the thing, and understanding the statistics, right? It's, you know, if you have a few percent chance of going, you have to weigh these factors. I probably wouldn't. But then again, I don't know if I would just be because of the radiation issue. So I would think that you would have so many other issues as we explore from microgravity alone that it could be a problem. I mean, I think this is probably the least of the worries that far. That's right. You have a technological failure, a rocket blowing up or air vent or something going wrong. Breaking a bone. Yeah. It's likely to be far more than these few percent. Um, and also, of course, there are many things you can do on Earth to yeah. change your risk of dying by far more than a few percent. That's right. Like anybody who smokes has got a 50% chance of dying from that. Lots of people smoke. And they can't smoke in space, so if you send the smokers into space... The chance of dying is way down. You've actually helped them with cancer. And, and that's a really weird statement to make, but that's the reality of probabilities and numbers. Even atmospheric pollution. I mean, yeah. if you take a, an Indian who lives in New Delhi, they've probably got a 10% chance of dying f from breathing the air there. If you put them in the nice foot air in the space station, they, they've got a 3% chance of dying from radiation, but you save them. 10% chance of dying from breathing the air back home. And, and so it's, it's not a straightforward answer. Yeah. So an interesting one. Mm.